There is no excuse for lazy money. With ImpactHousing.com, you can invest as little as $1,000 with a team with a tremendous track record at making investors money in apartment buildings. Not only does Impact Housing make you money, but it also serves its communities by providing wellness programs and feeding hungry kids. Now, don't let that lazy money in your bank or IRA off the hook. Put it to work investing in apartments. Go to ImpactHousing.com. That's ImpactHousing.com. You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast. I'd like to start out today by drawing your attention to wealthformula.com, where there are an abundance of resources for you in your financial education journey. Amongst them is a free copy of my Amazon number one best selling book, Seven Secrets of Eternal Wealth, which you can go to Amazon and buy, or you can get it for free at wealthformula.com. You can also just text me. 44222 and type wealth formula. Again, that's 44222 wealth formula. That's just one word. Don't let the autocorrect screw you up. And when you do that, you will get a free copy of my book in PDF format. Lots of resources there, right? I mean, you can use ways to save taxes, got downloads on passive cash flow investing and multifamily, et cetera, et cetera. There's also a free book from my friend, George Newberry Burn Zones, the book that every real estate investor must read, The Good, Bad, and The Ugly in the glamorous or not so glamorous world of apartment investing. So taking it to today's show, today's topic, I want to start out by recalling that in 19. 19- 43, a psychologist by the name of Abraham Maslow published a paper called A Theory of Human Motivation. And in this paper, he described what has come to be known as the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And basically, it's just a pyramid structure describing, you know, different levels of human motivation drivers. And at the bottom of this pyramid lies none other than physiological needs food, water, et cetera. And then you take it to the next level up and you get safety and security. Basically, listen, you need a roof over your head. And the pyramid continues upwards to its pinnacle, which is self-actualization, the ability to focus on one's mission in life. And I call this true wealth. After all, it's tough, ladies and gentlemen, to focus on your mission in life when you're trying to put food on the table and trying to keep your family safe from animals and infectious disease all at the same time. Now, make no mistake, trouble finding one's mission in life is a first world problem. Okay, we've got some of us have got first world problems. Now, let's apply some of these principles to investing. Now, in tough financial times, where should you focus your investments? Well, this is not that easy of a question, but maybe low-income housing makes sense. Now, the problem with low-income housing is that it is often pretty difficult to manage. And anybody who's been in real estate and multifamily real estate or single-family homes knows. I can tell you from personal experience with the first apartment building I ever bought, low-income housing usually, now I say usually, looks better on paper than it does in reality. Now, understand, I am not made to be a slumlord. I mean, that's just not me. My father, on the other hand, made millions of dollars throughout his life collecting rents with a baseball bat in one hand, but I didn't get that gene, folks. Now, if you can find people who are really good operators in this space, there is a lot of money to be made, and you can actually do a lot of good for communities at the same time. And one of the few operators in the low income housing space that I trust is a guy by the name of Michael Ayella. Now, Mike and his colleagues are killing it in the mobile home park space. So when we come back, Mike Ayala is going to tell us how Maslow Level 2 Investing can help your portfolio. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the United States. Our simple proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Learn how to find the best deals by downloading your free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Passive Real Estate Investing at noradarealestate.com. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Michael Ayala is managing partner, COO, 
and head of development at Four Peaks Capital Partners. Now, Mike has been an active participant in construction and management since he was 15 years old. And by the age of 24, he found his first construction company and has been involved with over 2,000 projects, totaling over a billion dollars. And in that portfolio includes hospitals, courthouses, federal buildings, casinos, mills, gold processing facilities, civil projects, multifamily homes, and shopping centers. Now of note, one of Mike's construction startups was so successful that it was included in the Inc. 2009 2500 fastest growing companies in America list before he sold it. He's also the owner of 160 mobile home lots, has renovated over 500 units, and manages over $1 million a year in rent center management. So with all that, please welcome my good friend, Mike Ayala. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for having me, Buck. Mike, how old are you? <laughs> I am going to be 39 in a few days. Yeah, uh, I'm going to say, well, you know, you're you're aging really well. You've got great skin, et cetera. But I will tell you, this is an, an unbelievable amount of accomplishment by 39. So congratulations to you, my friend. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks, now, for, thanks for the kudos. Yeah, yeah, of course. Fill us in on it, though. What's your story? And you you had, a, what was your path that led you to this whole glamorous world of mobile home parks? Yeah, well, you, you kind of alluded to some of it already, but essentially in 2004, I was 24 years old then, and I started our first construction company with a, with a partner, which we grew pretty quick to over 100 employees in a short period of time. And Ended up on the Inc. Fastest Growing Companies in America list in 2009, which, by the way, is a, a goal to hit again. And, and I believe it, at Four Peaks, we can we can do that. So we're pretty excited about that. Anyway, so I've always kind of had a, a knack and a desire for entrepreneurship and really through previous jobs. And then the, that company that we founded in 04 became pretty good at operations. And But, you know, the one thing for me, I, I knew that I didn't want to, you know, be 70 years old running my one company for the rest of my life. And also knew that we had to, you know, look into diversifying. And that's when the purple book that we always talk about fell into my hands. I got my hands on Rich Dad, Poor Dad around 05, 06. And that, that kind of started to change my whole paradigm. My wife, Karen, and I, we decided at that point in time that this was our big goal. We, we decided that we'd buy two income producing properties a year for, you know, the next 20 years. And that would kind of, you know, set us on a path to uh, basically what we thought would be financial independence. And I, I didn't completely understand leverage at that point in time. So, you know, we figured we'd get some mortgages and after we paid them off in 30 years or after the tenant paid them off in 30 years that, you know, that would kind of help us with retirement. And I figured if each one would, you know, clear us hundred dollars a month, we'd, we'd be okay at the end of it. And so that first year we went out and bought our first two rentals and ended up getting a commercial building that uh, we rented to our first company. And, and then out of nowhere in 2006, it might've been early 07. And this opportunity kind of fell in my lap. It was a 72 unit mobile home park. And I'd been pretty good friends with the manager and our company was doing quite a bit of work in the park. It needed a lot of maintenance and was kind of in disrepair as a lot of the parks that we buy are and been doing quite a bit of stuff in it. So then in 07, the investor that owned the park out of Las Vegas ran into some financial difficulties kind of leading up to the crash. And the, the manager called us and, and said that she needed she needed out ASAP and wanted to know if we were interested in it and asked him what the story was. And he basically said she needed $80,000 cashed out. And there was a first position note on it, assumable at 7%. But the, the kicker was she needed to close in 15 days. And, you know, I didn't, I had a little bit of real estate experience, but not much. We just bought our first rentals. And so, you know, I was kind of thrown for a, a loop there, but I, I knew it was a good deal. And the fact that she needed to close in 15 days was a little scary to me, but we, we knew the park title company said they could make it happen, barring any, you know, blemishes on title, et cetera. And so being out of my league, I, I did what we all should do. If, if it's not our natural tendency, I, I went to a mentor and asked him about the deal and he gave it a look and basically said, I was lucky that we were friends or he would have taken the deal from me. So we went out and put it under contract and were able to close the deal in uh, the 15 days and the rest is history, as they say. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Backing up though, a little bit. I mean, he didn't grow up in a, you know, an entrepreneur in an entrepreneurial family. I mean, you, you really kind of, did, were you even around one of the mobile home parks you ended up buying? I mean, I could be making this up, but I sort of remember you telling me something. That no, I Absolutely. My family moved to Northern Nevada 
in, I want to say 1986. And we lived in a, five of us lived in a one bedroom mobile home in a, in a mobile home park there for a, a year or so. Again, one bedroom, just, you know, all of us sleeping on couches and made do, but I, I, I didn't know any better. So no, you're absolutely right. I, I didn't, I didn't grow up in an entrepreneurial family. In fact, you know, my mom and dad both worked their, their tails off and um, still to this day, they're working hard just like everyone else. So yeah, definitely, definitely wasn't handed to me. Yeah. Right. Right. Good for you. So Let's talk a little bit about mobile home parks. What was your first experience with them? And, you know, why is this such a good opportunity? Closing on that park, it was kind of an eye opener to me. Started running into a lot of things that it, it's kind of interesting because a lot of these mobile home park owners, they, they're basically, you know, ma and pa operations, as we call them a lot of times. And the things they do in there are quite interesting. I, I tell this story quite a bit, but we, that first winter, we started having a bunch of lines freezing and we didn't know why. And come to find out the previous, one of the previous owners had actually, when a line would break or freeze or whatever, they dig a six inch deep trench and run garden hoses. And that, you know, that's the kind of stuff that you run into quite a bit with these mobile home parks on the negative side. But there's a lot of reasons why we're optimistic on them too. As long as you go into it knowing what you're doing and, and have the resources available and you have the right team in place, they, they can they can be a great asset and a great investment. So, you know, talk a little bit about the demographic. I mean, why is it a good time right now or is it? And again, why mobile home parks as an asset class as opposed to apartment buildings? Or is there something going on right now that would make it something to consider? Yeah, there's actually quite a few things specifically with a mobile home park. We're optimistic on it for quite a few reasons. I mean, number one, it's it's real estate. There's a lot of reasons for that. And we can go into that a little bit more. But some of the things that we re- really like, I mean, there's there's a, a giving back part of it. You know, 50% of Americans live on less than $600 a week and state of the economy and the way everything's going. I mean, that's only getting worse. And so affordable housing is is very needed in our communities and, and in America as a whole. And so, you know, we're extremely optimistic on that. I, I, I don't think things are necessarily getting better. In a lot of respects, they're getting worse. And so as as that happens, the the need for the affordable housing is huge. So, you know, we love it for that reason. They're not really making anymore. It's really hard to develop mobile home parks nowadays. A lot of municipalities, you know, they don't necessarily see things the way we do. And a lot of times they don't, they don't want mobile home parks being, being put in, in their municipalities. So it's pretty tough to get a new one developed. The other thing that we talk about a lot I don't, I wouldn't say anything's recession proof, but it's definitely recession resistant. In fact, you know, I've been asked quite a few times how, how our parks did through 08 and 09 and then we've never had a problem. In fact, as things get worse and, and salaries get tighter, we, we see our mobile home parks doing even better for that, for that same reason. You know, people are looking for affordable housing. Yeah. I mean, I housing. think if you can do it, I mean, if, if you're a good operator, it's a great asset class to be in because at the end of the day, the, the number of people who are probably going to, you know, be in that position where they need affordable housing is not, it's not going to get any better anytime soon. I mean, I think the writing is on the wall there that, you know, the middle class is shrinking or either you got a lot of money or you got no money at all. And like you said, you've got a demographic and you've got the shortage. They don't really make them anymore because of who wants a mobile home park in your neighborhood. If you got a nice home and stuff, it sort of brings down this perceived value. Right. Right. That's correct. Yeah. So now let's talk a little bit about how do you, you know, this is something I don't know a whole lot about, obviously just through you and Andrew, but now how are these assets? Like how are they, how are they set up? Because I mean, there's the land component, there's the, the, the homes, although the homes themselves are not, they're not like permanent fixtures, right? How do you look at this as an investor you know, what are the different streams of income? And, and when you come into something like this, are you usually doing all of it or are you doing some of it or what? Yeah. So it, it's kind of broken up in, in different parts. In, in general, we own the land, we own the lots, we own the infrastructure. You know, our model is to not own the home itself. Now, that being said, a lot of the parks that we purchase and buy and, and own, you know, a lot of the homes are owned by the parks, which brings its own challenges from a financing perspective and all that. But essentially our model is to sell the home to the resident themselves for, for various reasons. It creates pride of ownership. They stay longer. I've, I've said this quite a few times, you know, in real estate investing, there's not really any vacancy proof real estate asset out there. However, if you have a mobile home park where the resident owns the home, it's, it's about as close to zero vacancy as you can get. And, and one of the reasons for that, even if someone decides to move or they can't pay for their home, and we end up having to repossess that home, you know, that's a three, four month process. And then, you know, we can typically turn around and find another buyer for that home. And we've got various financing options for them as well, but we can typically 
get another buyer in there and the down payment from that next buyer will typically cover the lost rents. And so, you know, that's why I call it essentially zero vacancy. And yeah. Uh, so, but to answer your question, really the asset is, is the land and it's the infrastructure and it's the pads themselves. Right. But it, it takes a little bit of work to get that point. I mean, it sounds like, you know, when you have, you know, a lot of these mobile home parks that you guys are buying, you're buying distress. So it sounds like, wh- why are they distressed? I mean, are they distressed because people did not take that approach? Are they distressed because they didn't do a good job of selling the homes? I mean, wh- what's your typical, yeah. what do you see? Yes, yeah, so there's there's quite, a, there's quite a few reasons, but really, I mean, it can be narrowed down and it's, 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 it is somewhat typical. So a lot of times we'll see uh, these mobile home parks are owned by, you know, again, what we call Ma and Pa legacy owners. They've, they've owned it for, you know, 10, 20, 30 years sometimes. And while it probably did good for a long time, as, as time went on, they know, they know Jimmy down the street and, and, and they're sensitive to why he hasn't been paying his rent. And a lot of times they're not, they don't have the processes or the team in place. And, and so they're not really good at collecting rents and t- treating it as a business versus, you know, friends and, and, and again, just a Ma and Pa outfit. And then the other side of it too, over time, uh, you know, a lot of these homes have either been so destroyed because of the rental model or they were moved out, you know, as someone owns the home, they get the home paid for, and then they buy a piece of, you know, a one acre land outside of town and, and they move the home out themselves over the years. And, you know, so a lot of times these parks that we're buying are, you know, 30, 40% occupied. And we turn these parks around through uh, several different ways, but, you know, one of them being, we've got a construction company, we've currently got crews in five different states. So we're able to rehab homes that other other operators wouldn't be able to rehab. And the other side of it too, we've got a, we've got a pretty cool relationship, which we can go into if you want to with uh, Warren Buffett. He's, he's pretty optimistic on, on this space. And so we've got a setup where, you know, we can actually bring in new homes in a pretty efficient manner and, and, and fill these parks back up. But is that the lending arm? Is that the lending arm or what is that? Yeah. So we work with a company called 21st Mortgage, as well as other financing companies that we have in place. And, and we're able to buy homes through Clayton Homes and, and get these homes set in our parks. And, and that again, that's one of the methods that we use to, to turn these parks around. So, but really at the end of the day, you know, they've just been ran down over time. And if, you, if you've got the right team in place, you can really, you can turn these parks around, but it, it's not an overnight process. And, and, and it does take some work. You know, there's a lot of people out there thinking that it's, you know, easy and you're going to get it done in three months. It's really not the case. It's pretty intense. Yeah. And to your point, I mean, I think low-income housing in general is, is, um, like I've always said, you know, I'm, I'm just, I don't have the genes for it, but certainly as in somebody who can manage that and turn it around as an operator. But, you know, if it's something that you can do, obviously there's a, a real opportunity there. I mean, there's some major, major players involved now in mobile home parks that, that weren't really there before, isn't there? There is. There's quite a few people in, you know, more and more than ever coming into the space. Some There's some successful operators that have been in the space for a while, but again, we're seeing, we're seeing more and more. And really at the end of the day, it's, it's really about the team and not, not that you know, we want to go too far into this, but we've we've got an entire company called Park Place Communities that just focuses on the management and the turnaround of these parks, and and we've got a great management team, we've got a great construction team, we've we've got a great sales team that their entire focus is inventory and selling these homes, and so we've we've got quite a process we've built out right. over the last year or two, and it's going pretty well. What if anything? I mean, I mean, you mentioned a little bit about the fact that it's a lot of work, right? Is there any other real negatives to this asset class from your perspective? We've touched on some of it, but it definitely, you know, it requires a different skill set to manage. They're very management intense. Another one of the real downsides, if you're not aware and you don't have the right team in place, every state for the most part has different regulations on number one, who who manages manufactured housing, who oversees it. Some states, it's the DMV. Some states, there's a specific entity that's created just to oversee manufactured housing. So it's it's pretty- um, It's a business. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, I think that's one of the things that I think people kind of don't see. But sometimes, you know, these opportunities, they look they look like, wow, they're getting better cash flow. Yeah, but it's also more work. And 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 typically with a business is it. If you do it very well, like you guys do, you can make a lot of money, but it's a business, right? That's correct. That's so, correct. And, and, you know, one of back, back to the, you know, the statement you make about it being a business, that's one of, I've got a lot of friends that are investing in apartment complexes and, and, you know, apartments are a great asset, but you can pretty much go into any market and buy an apartment complex and find a property manager. And that's right. not necessarily the case with mobile home parks. For the most part, you're not gonna be able to just go out and, and find a mobile home park and then hire a manager to operate that and turn it around for you. So the reason why we're so optimistic on mobile home parks is really that, 
fact that we've got the team in place as well. That's a huge part of it. So it, you're yeah. right. It's a business. So tell me about tell me about the company. So with the overriding company is Four Peaks, but there is sort That's of different parts of this. How, how does it all work? That's correct. So we've got a we've got a company called Four Peaks Capital Partners. I've got two amazing partners, Andrew Lenoy and Mauricio Raul, to just phenomenal backgrounds and couldn't ask for a, a better team to work with. So Four Peaks is our equity company. And, and you know, we work with investors through Four Peaks. We raise capital through Four Peaks to, to place in these, these assets and got a world-class team there as well. And then our, our team that's specifically focused on the mobile home park communities is Park Place Communities. So when we do, uh, assuming it's a it's a mobile home park asset that we purchase at Four Peaks, then the, the team at Park Place Communities steps in and turns that asset around and manages it. Right, right. So it's uh, sort of like a holding company and then you kind of, you know, you've got everything internally. It, it sounds like it's been growing pretty fast and you're, you know, actually in the mobile home park space, one of the actually already in a very short period of time, one of the bigger players. Yeah, that's right. In a little over two years, you know, we've made it to the top 100 owner operators. And and our goal really in the next three to five years is to be a top 10 owner operator in, in the country. So, you know, we're, we're here to stay and we're pretty optimistic on it. And, and our entire focus over the last 12 months has really been building out the team and, and getting ready to make those next steps. So. There was an offering through Investor Club with uh, you guys, with Andrew, and some people are familiar. Everybody's quite happy so far. And But let people know if they're they're interested in learning more, getting in touch about you, about you know Four Peaks, et cetera. How can we reach out? We've got a report that your listeners can get at www.reservedinvestments.com. It's a due diligence report, You know things for people to be looking for with investments and companies that you're going to be investing with, make sure that, you know, they're looking at all the right things for due diligence. So our, our website's www.fourpeakspartners.com. And that you can is reach that, out to is us that either the way. number four or the, uh, is it written out? F-O-U-R. Got it. Got it. Written Got out. It. Yeah, yep. yeah. I was just testing your ability to spell. Well, <laughs> thanks. Anyway, listen, Mike, as always, it's a pleasure. Thanks for uh, being on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. My good friend, Michael Ayella, ladies and gentlemen, we will be right back. Attention to credit investors, I've got an opportunity for you. This property has been featured by Time Magazine and Coastal Living. It's called Mahogany Bay Village, and it's a first major luxury branded hotel in Ambergris Key, Belize, TripAdvisor's number one island destination. Enjoy fractional ownership in a resort branded by one of the most recognized hotel brands in the world. Buy new vacation rental inventory below market value. Still not convinced? Well, how about double digit projected returns? Go to wealthformula.com under our investment opportunities tab and click Mahogany Bay Village. This opportunity is not going to be around for long, so don't miss the boat. What do the Rothschilds, the Romneys, and the billionaire hedge fund managers know that you don't about growing and protecting wealth? As you might imagine, the wealthy have a few tricks up their sleeves. One strategy allows you to grow wealth tax-free at a compounding rate with no volatility. It protects your money from creditors and lawsuits and it lets you invest the same money in two different places at the same time. How about that for amplifying wealth? To learn more, go to wealthformulabanking.com. Again, that's wealthformulabanking.com. Now, welcome back to the show, everyone. I'm sure that uh, Mike's interview there stirred some low-income interest in many of you. And in theory, I'm a big fan of low-income housing. But like I said before, it has to be in the hands of an operator that knows what he's doing or what she's doing. And Mike is one of those guys in his team. Now, I got to tell you, podcast downloads for Wealth Formula, Wealth Formula podcast have really picked up. And I want to thank you for that. Last month alone, we exceeded 30,000 downloads. Now, I got to tell you, that is really amazing for a podcast that's just over a year old. So I couldn't be more proud. The great thing, too, is that that means that you are getting value from the show, which is what my first world problem is. You know, it's not my first world problem. It's my first world goal in life. It's my self-actualization point. And that is that I want to make a difference for you. Now, going back to those podcast numbers, one of the reasons the numbers are growing at the pace they are is because more and more of you are subscribing and leaving me five-star reviews on iTunes. And I appreciate that because not only are you doing me a favor, but you're doing other people a favor. You see, every time you do that, I mean, that's what 
iTunes looks at is it ranks a podcast higher. And more and more people are now finding me just organically than necessarily just, you know, hearing from another friend that it's a good show or hear me on another show. A lot of people are finding it organically on iTunes and that's really exciting. So if you like what I'm doing, please go to iTunes and tell the world. Here's a good news, man. We have some pretty amazing shows coming up in the next couple months, and I want to touch as many people as I can. And there's just lots of stuff going to happen this next year, so I'm pretty excited about it. Anyway, thank you for listening. This is Buck Joffrey with Wealth Formula Podcast, signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not facts. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.